Everybody's clock says 8 o'clock. And we got a good little bit to do today. Uh, thank y'all for getting here this early. I know it was raining and traffic. You know, these people up here don't know how to drive when somebody sneezes hard. So uh, I appreciate you, you making the effort to, uh, to get here. All of a sudden, we have started getting bills assigned to Ag Committee. And uh, we really hadn't had a whole lot to do lately. But uh, before we get started, uh, Clay, would you mind asking the good Lord to look after us, please, sir? Thank you, sir. Um, we are honored today for Commissioner Lynn Riley with Department of Revenue. It's the first time you've ever been to Ag meeting, isn't it? And uh, <laughs> we we glad you we glad you back. Uh, she used to be one of us, and then she got a high-paying job, and uh, I don't blame her for taking it. She's doing a great job, I think, with DOR and Commissioner Black. We must have a gate bill to deal with when y'all two show up together. So uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about one in a little bit. But first, uh, Dean Sam Pardue every year comes and kind of brings us up to date on what's happening at the, at the College of Ag. And uh, so if you will go ahead, please, sir. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Come up here on this side. You may want to turn or crane your neck uh, for the screen. And, and uh, I normally don't follow the Chinese calendar, but this is the year of the dog, by the way, <laughs> and we will accept that. And I, and I looked and it said, if you're born in the year of the dog, that you've got great skills in communication, that you're serious and you're responsible in the workplace. And I hope that is what, what a UGA graduate looks like. Uh, I will tell you that while the football team had a phenomenal year, they are not the only highly ranked group and I will uh, take great pride in telling you that Nick Chubb is one of the College of Ag uh, students. He's studying uh, econom uh, ag e uh, economics. But this is a rating agency that, and, and I cannot vouch for the validity of these, but I'm going to <laughs> promote them because I think they make the University of Georgia look good. Number one poultry science department in the country. Plant breeding, we're ranked second in the country. Plant pathology, eight. Food science, nine. Soil science and crop, crop and soils, 10. Horticulture 10, top 10 in the country. And then entomology is ranked eighth in the world. <laughs> so our bug people now, they've got two challenges. One, solving the white fly problem. And somebody told me, said, there will be a statue in every town below the gnat line if you can figure out how to get rid of the gnats. <laughs> so we're gonna turn our entomologists on to that as well. Ag Econ is ranked 17th in the world. So there are some phenomenal programs that are uh, in the college that we're certainly proud of. There's more that we can do and we appreciate all the great support you provide us. I wanna tell you about some really good news. Uh, last week, the Board of Regents saw fit to approve a new major for the college, hospitality and food industry management. And we're really excited about that. Tourism and hospitality is the second largest industry in the state of Georgia. About $35 billion a year so we're gonna marry the number one economic driver in the state, agriculture, with the number two. And that's gonna be a program, the surveys we took will probably have somewhere around 200 to 250 students in three years in this program. Uh, and we're really excited about that potential. Some new uh, changes. Uh, there are nine departments in the college and uh, we're gonna get four new ones this year. I promise I am not running people off, but uh, we had some changeover. Dr. Leslie Edgar is going to head up uh, agricultural uh, leadership education and communications. Uh, she's at the University of Arkansas where she's a professor and assistant dean. Francis Fluharty is at The Ohio State University and he's gonna head up our animal and dairy science department. He's coming in May. 
And then Janine Shearer, who's in Crop and Soils at the University of Delaware, is going to uh, provide leadership in that department. On the research side, uh, Dr. Bob Stugard, who's at uh, Montana State, is going to come and be the new assistant dean for research. He'll have primary responsibilities over uh, our, our overall research infrastructure. And then many of you know, perhaps uh, Dr. Doug Bailey, for many years was the department head in horticulture. He's now become the assistant dean for academic programs, joining Dr. Joe Broder. And so we are in search of a new department head in horticulture. So those are some of the leadership changes that are occurring. I want to give you a snapshot of the class of 2017. Where are they at? On the right-hand side, those numbers in red represent the university's averages. So full-time employment, 53% of our students who were in the class of 17 are employed full-time. 1% are self-employed. 34%, over a third, have gone on to graduate school and professional school. Others are in internships, part-time. Now, I've got, I want to talk to the ones that said that are not seeking employment. I'd, I'd like to have a conversation with their parents, but that's only 1%. <laughs> and then those that are looking are three. So it's pretty good. I mean, we've got folks who, about 97% of those who graduated in, in the class of 17 are employed or going uh, to school or taking an internship. One of the things that we are, uh, we're proud in the college, in, in this slide, the green bars indicate the College of Ag, the red bars indicate the University of Georgia for, for uh, three cohorts, 2014, entering class 15 and 16. And this is the first year retention. What percent of those students who come as freshmen come back for their sophomore year? And you can see uh, the college actually was slightly better than the university average for the last two years. But both are exceptional. I mean, they're in the mid-90s. And that is a, that's a remarkable retention rate. Um, my thought is that if you can't retain them, you can't graduate them. So we've got to figure out a way for those students to return. And, and we recognize that some folks get homesick and they just want to go home. And maybe Athens is just not for them or, or our other programs as well. So we're, we're excited about that opportunity. If you look at enrollment relative to where uh, our students are coming from. Again, the green bars are the college, the red bars are uh, the university. Last figures I saw by the definitions used to define rule, about 16% of the Georgia population is rural. If you look at the enrollment in the college, it's certainly significantly above that. Uh, for the university, it's a little, uh, about a percentage point and a half below what that demographic would predict, but again, very close. And you would have an expectation that our programs would draw students from rural Georgia to a higher degree, perhaps, than the university as a whole. Degrees awarded. And uh, I, I'm really pleased to tell you that um, nearly 30% of our degrees were awarded to rural students in Georgia out of the college. And again, about 15% um, for the university. So we are making an impact. Are we doing as good a job? Absolutely not, but we're making progress and I'm encouraged by some of the trends that we're seeing. I don't know if you saw this article recently in uh, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Uh, I, I don't, I, I think this tells us that we've got some educating to do to, with folks. Uh, and he used terms as far-flung localities, far away outposts from the sticks and the boondocks. Uh, and quite frankly, I'll embrace that because that's where I grew up. Uh, but I think it points to us that particularly those of us in agriculture need to do a, a better job of informing the entire population. Uh, but I'm, I'm in, not all of the media is critical. I love this article that occurred uh, not, well, just a few days ago, New York Times. It was talking about land-grant universities, and I, and I love this quote. He says, a farmer's kid is probably going to be a better engineer than an engineer's kid. The engineer's kid is given a problem and sees a piece of paper. The farmer's kid sees a problem and thinks back to the time that the bridge washed out. So some practical experiences there. So even the New York Times has some positive things to say. And I don't know if you know much about Nucor Steel, but it is a, a one of the more profitable steel companies. Uh, article that appeared a number of years ago, they said that they wanted to build their steel plants in areas where they could find farmers. They said they want to find folks who get up early and get something done before noon. And he said, we want to hire the best we can find. He said, farmers made the best folks to work in the steel mill. 
And, and he said, we hire five, work them like 10, pay them like eight. So, I mean, if you have expectations for people, I'm glad that they're going to at least compensate them. Uh, last year, I brought to you some information that not all was rosy in, in rural Georgia, in fact, in rural America. Uh, these are some data from uh, uh, Dean Ben Ayers in the Terry uh, College. And it looks at home prices throughout Georgia pre-recession compared to today. And those that are in black have actually seen an appreciation in the value of their homes. If you're in the Atlanta area, almost a 10% increase. But if you're in Valdosta or Albany, even Macon, the expansion and the increase in value in homes has not been equal throughout the state. So while there's been areas that have recovered, surely it has not been uniform. Uh, my dad taught history, so forgive me if I look back in, in time and try to look at where we're at. In 1917, the top 10 companies in the United States, three of them were ag companies. Two were meat processors, Armour and Company and Swift and Company. And I'm going to claim International Harvester pretty much is, a, is an ag company as well. Jump forward five, uh, 50 years, you'll see IBM, AT&T, Eastman Kodak, for example, and Polaroid. And I want to point out, watch what happens with Kodak and Polaroid. 2017, the vast majority of these are all tech companies in the top. Apple, Alphabet, of course, is the, the company that owns Google. Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. And I'm trying to look, I guess Johnson & Johnson, and perhaps to an extent, ExxonMobil, are the only things that actually make something. The others are, are gonna be software manufacturers, uh, computing technology. Uh, one of the challenges that we have in higher education is, uh, of course, student loans and, and student debt. Um, my kids like to watch the Game of Thrones, and there's a takeoff on this. The parody is called Game of Loans. Interest is coming. And for many millennials, that's a challenge. And I'm grateful that the University of Georgia graduates its classes with some of the lowest uh, debt, student debt in the country. But if you look, debt is something that we all have to deal with. And, and student loans, for example, is the second largest, $1.27 trillion in student debt. The only thing that's bigger is the debt that we associate with our mortgages. So people have invested a tremendous amount of money. States have invested a tremendous amount of money in higher education, and yet we're still seeing tremendous debt. 44 million Americans right now have about $1.3 trillion in student debt, and you can see the average debt load that has changed over time. And I hope, for example, I'm really proud of the fact that 97% of the graduates of the class of 2017 from the College of Ag are either employed or going to school or in an internship. You can't pay a loan back if you don't have a job. So I am I'm proud of the fact that our students have a way to pay those debts if they have them. Uh, I want to thank this body for the great work that you do because not every state in this country is as in good a financial shape as the state of Georgia. For example, you can see when that red circle is bigger than the blue circle, that means that your debts and obligations are greater than all of your assets. And as you can see there, Illinois, New Jersey, Maine, Connecticut, Louisiana is struggling as well, but I am grateful that our circle is surrounded by blue, meaning that the legislature has been very, very good stewards of the state's resources. In fact, if you look at a ranking of what is the value of higher education in each state, Georgia ranks fifth in the country on return on investment. That if you get a college degree in the state of Georgia, you will pay that back in 2.4 years. Now I know a number of you have businesses. If somebody were to tell you, if you buy this piece of equipment, you'll, you'll make that money back in 2.4 years, that's a pretty good return. And you can see those other country, excuse me, those other states that provide uh, a difference. The salary differential is twenty-three thousand dollars a year. That's the average for every year that that individual is going to be working. So again, they're going to help provide more resources to the state through taxes as well. Well, I can't give a talk without 
to my favorite subject right now is white flies. It has been a, uh, white flies have been with us forever, but the last several years have just been exceptionally difficult. Mild winters has impacted um, their populations. They've overwintered. I, I, I'm really hoping that some of the cold weather that we got is going to provide us with some, some relief, but we, uh, we have a great team working across commodity groups that have been very supportive. In fact, they, they realize the challenges there. The university, and we hope that the state also will contribute to finding a solution to this problem. Uh, it, it has really impacted a lot of uh, fruit and vegetable growers as well as cotton. And even I, I'm, you know, I'm a poultry scientist by training, and I'm not uh, in crops, but those are on the left were not treated and been affected by white flies on that upper on that left panel, and then you can see the different rows that were treated, and those that are the the whiter colors indicate the infestation of white flies. So it is it is a real problem, particularly in South Georgia. Uh, I'm going to close with something that uh, I'm actually surprised and concerned about, <coughs> and and I like in the future perhaps we'll have further discussions. But one of the things that is disturbing to me is that the frequency in which our farmers are taking their own lives. Uh, this was an article from, uh, from London, The Guardian. Why are Americans farmers killing themselves at record numbers? New York Post, depression and suicide are rampant among American farmers. This from Newsweek, death on the farm, and it told the story of a, of a farmer in the Midwest, or excuse me, in New York, and this was a letter that he left before he took his life. He said, lonely, discouraged, overwhelmed, no hope, can't go on, danger to my family, worn out, the kids are so talented, Gwen, you're a good person, so sorry. So this person saw no way out because of all the pressures that they were receiving on the farm. So these are from CDC. The green line indicates rule, rule America, and these are deaths per 100,000. The blue line are large metro areas. <coughs> Red, medium and small metro, and then that orange or yellow color is the United States. Folks, when those rates are 50% higher in rural America, I want to know why and what can we do to make a difference. And if you look among males, quite frankly, it's even worse. And again, rural males are far more likely to take their own life than those who live in metro and suburban areas. In fact, if you're in agriculture and you're a farmer, it has the highest suicide rate among occupations that the CDC tracks, 85 per 100,000. Now remember, the average for males in rural America is around 30, but if you're a farmer, it's almost triple that. Construction workers and miners, even those police officers, firemen, first responders, is about a third that of those in farming. And of course, education's on that other end of the scale. I never knew about this until a couple of months ago. It is a profound issue that we're facing. Why is it? Farming is a wonderful lifestyle, but it is also one that has a lot of stress in it. What other profession do you put the majority of your liquid capital and net worth at risk every year? Access to lethal means. Farming is a 24-7 job. You don't really get a day off, and you don't have to be in the dairy business to not have a job that's 24-7. You can't figure out and control the weather, disease, insects. You are your own boss, but you're also your own employee, and so there's a lot, a lot of things that are, are on um, the, in the lives of farmers. So in that, let me close and just say, uh, every time you're fed, I hope you'll thank somebody that wears Georgia red. A couple of handouts for you. One is our, uh, our B-Budget Ask for this year, uh, and we would appreciate any consideration you might give for those. And then I've given you a couple of, of uh, handouts that look at retention and graduation rates within the uh, University of Georgia system. And this year, my favorite is the uh, ag snapshots. I told somebody we got rid of about two thirds of the words and we got a lot more pictures in there. So I'm a graphically oriented person and I can, I can certainly understand certain of those things. 
So, um, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity again and happy to answer any questions. Dean, thank you so much for taking time to come. You have a couple of people want to ask you something if you got a second. Certainly. Ms. Susan. Thank you, sir. Dean Perdue, I thank you so much for a very nice presentation. Uh, as I look around this room, I am probably the oldest UGA graduate here, and I have long been a real advocate and fan of the Ag School. My father was a graduate of 35. So um, I, I just want to say thank you for you and your folks doing such a good, and for making us very proud. You. You, you, you just, you know, the University of Georgia is very special to me, my family, and this state, and I think I can speak for this whole group and say thank you very much. We appreciate you, y'all, and the good job you do. Yes, ma'am. Thank you much. Go dogs. Go dogs. <laughs> Tom, is that you? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, real quick, and I, I may hit you with something that you're not aware of, uh, something I was looking at. I, I certainly believe in the intent of the Morrell Land Grant Act. It's been a great thing for this country. And, but looking at the University of Georgia and the relationship or ratio between our population and the college, we are kind of the smallest of all the southeast and the surrounding states. We, we haven't seemed to have the growth. What, is that a problem? I, I, to me, it seems to be a problem, and I think we, we ought to do something about it to expand that college over there. Right. Well, um, part of the challenge is that I refer to the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences as the cradle of colleges at the University of Georgia, and here's why. Warnell School of Forestry used to be in the college. Family and Consumer Science used to be in the college. More recently, engineering, ag engineering in 2012 mm -hmm. got pulled out. So we would be a lot larger if everybody came home. <laughs> now, I'm not advocating that because I, I, <laughs> Dean Allen Dorsey over in Franklin can have all those, those folks. I, I like our size. <clears throat> but, you know, the university uh, itself is capped in its enrollment, but not the college. And so we have to do a better job, I think, in, in certainly recruiting and telling our story to people that there is a future and an opportunity and a career in agriculture. Uh, I will tell you that students from South Georgia are actually admitted at a slightly higher rate than those from Metro Atlanta. The problem is we just don't have enough who apply. And that, that is something that we'll have to go back and look at. But your, your comment, I'd love to have some more students. I think this new major <coughs> will attract some perhaps non-traditional students who want to get in the hospitality business. And maybe they'll discover, wow, I've really got an interest in ag business or agronomy. Um, but your, your point's well taken. I, I'd love to have a few more, and we'll just have to do a better job in recruiting. Uh, Dominic. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dean Pardue, for your presentation. Um, and I'm sure you, you are know where I'm going. <laughs> um, just wanted to, to share a little bit about the Rural Development Council and traveling around the state. And one of the major issues that I think we heard in these communities was a uh, a lack of leadership and because so many of our leaders are retiring and moving on and mm -hmm. and uh, going and enjoying some well-earned time off but 4-H in these rural counties are so important to grow in future leaders their mission is a hands-on education and leadership training for future generations um, in my home county coffee county one of the top poultry counties top row crop counties um, is just struggling and and this is my fourth session my fourth year in the general assembly and i've begged for some help for a funding for 4-h uh, directors and program assistants every year that i've been up here one of the top 4-h programs in the state uh, i was at a hog show this weekend getting ready for in one of our new hog barns that our, our livestock barns that we paid for with splash money um and the 4-h director was there every minute i was there which was a day and a half uh, including Saturday. And uh, just want to remind you again that uh, so much of the leadership in these communities for future generations is coming out of 4-H and FFA and uh, hopefully moving on to ABAC or University of Georgia College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. But we have got to start working with these kids at an early age in agriculture, in leadership training and education but we simply cannot fund all of it at the county level. We've got to have your help in funding 4-H programs for these counties. And I do appreciate you and the hard work that you do to try to divide all that money evenly. And uh, just wanted to, to speak on their behalf. Thank you. I, I can appreciate that. And, uh, 
you know, one of the requests that's coming for uh, this cycle is 12 cooperative extension educator positions that will help uh, su provide some additional support and, and may work into that. But I, I, I understand your, your concern and your need, and I think it's a very valid one. If you look at the young men and women who go through 4-H and FFA, they're more likely to finish high school. They're more likely to go on to college. They're less likely to, to get involved in substance abuse. A uh, whole host of benefits that come from that. And you know, in 4-H, which I know a little bit more about, uh, 175,000 young people in this state every year get that kind of experience. And you've seen those young men and women when they speak in front of a group, at their age, I probably couldn't get three words out of my mouth, but they are articulate, they're poised, because they've been given that experience. And I will pass that along to uh, the Director Laura Perry Johnson and make sure she, uh, she hears that, no doubt. Dean, thank you. Uh, I agree with you with the AJC article. I'm proud to be from the boondock. What I'm prouder of is that you can't even buy an AJC in the boondock where I live. <laughs> Well, he talked about, you know, we're going to be sending money from Atlanta to South Jordan. I said, you know what? We send about 100% of your food here. That's right. And if you think that's a bad trade, we'll, we'll talk about it. Tell Thank them you. to quit eating if they want to boycott us. <laughs> uh, the one other thing that we do every year that I'm, I'm proud of, too, with the Dean and Gary and um, Terry England and John Wilkinson and all is uh, Jerry Moorhead, ever since he's been there, has been a special advocate for agriculture. And uh, normally we fly them around the state to different agricultural industries and, and teach them about agriculture, and we appreciate him doing that. Last year, we just got in a van and rode around Clark County, and where we went to was greenhouses and Georgia green industry. And today, y'all will find a plant in your office or on your desk, I don't know where they put them, uh, and Chris Butts is, uh, is the exec executive director, is that what you are, whatever. president, whatever you are, uh, of the Georgia Green industry. They will be at Rural Caucus. And, and real quick, would you want to say something right quick? He has a couple of yes, horticulture right. students. Right. One's from New Jersey, and the other one is from uh, Newton, right? Yep, these folks are actually some of the folks that help grow out those plants that you'll find um, through the UK Horticulture Department. So we just like to say thank you for the support from the Muir Committee, Mr. Chairman. Um, if you look in that ag snapshot book, look at horticulture. Ornamental horticulture is a top five commodity group in the state of Georgia. It's often overlooked. People don't realize how big the industry is, but it's a $8 billion economic impact every year, and it employs about 85,000 people. So thank you for serving for your support, and let us know if we can help. You. Thank you, Chris. I think if you saw on one of the Dean's slide, plant breeding is number two in the nation. Is that right? Number two. A lot of that is the plants that these people uh, grow and sell and make a yard look good. Uh, one quick thing, if y'all like the peanut butter and jelly day, if you hadn't signed this resolution and might want to, I'm just gonna pass it around and if you like those peanut butter sandwiches. Uh, I guess we need to get down to business. Uh, Chairman Jasper's had to go somewhere, so do you wanna go ahead and do uh, whatever your bill number is, 948? There we go. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have to go to rules. Uh, appreciate your help getting me there to the Mr. Chairman on time. If you look in your folder, you see House Bill 948. Uh, it was dropped the other day and assigned to the committee yesterday. And this is a time of speed and trying to get things through. This bill, contrary to what you've heard, is about the free market and consumer choice. It's simple, but to understand it, you gotta know a few things, and I'll take a minute to kind of tell you about our government, how it regulates, so we're all on the same page. <clears throat> this bill talks about goods on line 15. And goods means all things that are movable at the time of identica identification to the contract for sale. That's just about everything. That in our bill says that are regulated by the FDA, USDA, and the Georgia Department of Agriculture. You know, FDA regulates, of course, food, drugs, additives, everything that goes in it. They're guaranteeing us safety. USDA's biggest role is inspection of meat that we think of, but it's also livestock movement, disease eradication, 
also pet breeding and the regulating of that. You know, the Georgia Department of Agriculture and our friends there enforce many USDA laws as a federal cooperator. They also inspect and regulate many things we tell them to. And of these groups, we hold responsible to guarantee safety and healthiness of the goods sold. You know, we give the Georgia Department of Ag Agriculture additional powers each year to things. Over the years, I've remembered us working on farmers market sales, Vidalia onion dates and sales, avian influenza. But they also inspect the state's pet breeders. Georgia's a great state to do business. And our business people want uniform laws that are thoughtful, pro-business, and free trade. <clears throat> I think you'll see in the next few days a lot of pro-business groups putting out notifications that they support this bill. This bill reemphasizes the idea that we as legislators at the state level will control what is legal to sell in the state and what is not. We will create, we do create uniformity for business owners to operate without fear in the state due to a political or social reaction on whom that may occur. So this bill states that a city or county or political district cannot create a law to make it a good illegal to sell if it's regulated by the, the ones that we talked about. This, le this legislation clarifies that local governments do not have the authority to restrict the trade of products deemed legal and regulated. I'm trying to give you a, just an example I thought of on Sunday when I, was, when I was writing this. Just think if you're a small business owner in Jasper or Fort Valley, and you sell a good I described. It's been regulated by the agencies I described. You bought a building, you've, been, you've renovated it, you've been there three years, five years, who knows. Your goods are legal. The consumers in your area want them. They buy them. That's why you're still in business. You might even have the Georgia Department of Agriculture come to your business and inspect it, or local county health department. You get an A, a check, A plus, whatever. But you cross the city councilman, or the city councilman becomes passionate about a social issue. You might offend him. He gets his other city council members and commissioners to vote to make your product illegal. Now, if you're the retailer, do you feel like this, that Georgia, your county, now is the number one place to do business? Do you wonder what happened to free enterprise? Does the local government really have the authority to put me out of business for selling a legal product? And do you wonder why we have the regulatory scheme we have in place to address these issues at the state and federal level? The answer is that local governments shouldn't be doing this. Local governments have assumed this right under the banner of local control to shut down businesses operating legally and selling a legal product. Their liberal interpretation of home rule puts our free market at risk and, and the rule of law at risk. Our claim as the number one state to do business is at risk. Now, I've heard a lot of noise, as you have on this issue. On this issue. I've received many emails from the Humane Society activists who want local governments to ban pet stores emails from local officials who want to do what they want to do, and even lectures from radio personalities who really haven't read the bill. They all have an agenda, and it's not to protect the free market and the rule of law. Cities and counties have currently great power to inspect facilities of business for safety, not only the workers, but the consumers, the customers, the healthiness of the products, if they choose to. We're not stopping or inhibiting them from doing that. If the local citizens are unhappy with the ins inspections of a regulated business by the Georgia Department of Agriculture or USDA, they need to voice their opinions specifically on that to the right authority. And if that authority doesn't listen, they need to come to us, the legislature, and we'll work on it by putting people together and solving the issues as we always do and create a more tightly and effective regulatory framework if we need to. This bill doesn't strike any regulatory power or local control already granted to them under home rule. It doesn't restrict local governments from taking action, nor does it restrict enforcement on any legal product being used illegally. This bill is not taking away powers from local government. Local communities should enforce standards 
but they should not discriminate against retailers who are operating legally. The beauty of the free market is that it operates on supply and demand principles. If you object to a product, don't buy it. If the community objects, the business will fail. It's not local government's role to pick winners and losers in the marketplace. And we should reserve that right for the consumer. I hope you'll vote yes on House Bill 948. And Mr. Chairman, that's my presentation. I'll be glad to answer the committee's questions. Thank you, Rick. Is anybody got any questions? Uh, who's seven? Is that you, Dominic? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm supportive of your bill. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in favor of it, but I do want to make a comment because of the number of times we run into these issues being from rural parts of the state. There is a little bit of me that wants to let these liberal, highly den you know, densely populated areas pass these crazy ordinances to their own demise. <laughs> and maybe they'll move to rural Georgia. <laughs> and a lady called me talking about traffic congestion here a couple of months ago, and I mean, she was eating me up. She was from Stockbridge down in that area, and I said, well, move. Get out of there. You chose to live there. So in as much as I'm supportive of what we're trying to do and think we need to do it, there is a little bit of me that would like to see them pass all these crazy ordinances to their own demise. Kevin, you got All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad you showed up this morning. Yes, sir. A <laughs> <I had little laughs> little traffic issues on Memorial, so. Um, and apparently I made a wrong turn. GSP let me know that. Um, <laughs> quick, quick question, uh, Representative Jaspers. Um, and, and my question goes to not so much the Georgia Department of Agriculture, who does an outstanding job, and Commissioner Black in his office, but why would we um, look at any authority by the federal government whatsoever, even, even when we have somebody friendly uh, in the federal government, uh, particularly to Georgia, um, and cede any authority from local governments to the federal government in any way, shape, or fashion? Our I think our bill doesn't do that, Representative Cook. Our bill take, says that we have the authority at the state level, and we have, and that's what we're doing. You know, we're enforcing the laws and for safety, as it says, coming to us from USDA, FDA. We're doing that now. Does that answer? Um, well, I, I guess more specifically, I, in your comments, um, you referenced Commissioner Black and sometimes how the Georgia Department of Agriculture has to essentially um, enforce some of the rules and regulations from the United States Department of Agriculture, which uh, at least to a certain degree, maybe if, if I'm wrong, you can correct me there, but um, I'm sure he doesn't always agree, just like I might not always agree with what they say and what they do. Um, so if, if we don't on the state level agree with that, uh, and we're removing a little control from the local folks to maybe have some disagreements there, when it's us in the Georgia Department of Agriculture, they come directly to us. It's, it's more difficult then for a local government to go to the federal side um, than it would be home folks, is, is well, what I'm think, saying. Is there any consideration there? Cook, that's where we would petition the federal government. We have congressmen and senators. I've got, we have a representative from a senator in here today that we can petition to act on any issue that is affecting from the federal government down to us. And I think we do that quite often. Right. I, I would just, my concern is how often you they actually the react government. positively towards us. You don't want the federal government messing in our business, right? Ever. There you go. <laughs> I, actually, I just want them to stay to their constitutional bounds. I just don't want to give them a lot more power, as it were. I don't, I don't, I don't mind I don't think with the do. Georgia Department of Agriculture, but it, that, that's a concern that I have. But anyway, thank you for your answer. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, we have three people signed up to talk on, uh, on 948, and we appreciate y'all coming. Uh, since we are in a time constraint, the boss lady up here has a timer on her phone. I don't know how to run all that stuff, but uh, anyway, if we could hold it to a couple of minutes, I would appreciate it. Uh, Chelsea, R Rupertsburg, is that it? That's it. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you, ma'am.
Uh, Michael? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Michael McPherson with the Georgia Municipal Association. I, um, I, I know that the Chairman's very passionate about this, and we appreciate you bringing it forward. But uh, it's, it's my responsibility, as I know, that, that each of you cares very much about your communities to let you know that there is fundamental flaws uh, in this bill that need to be considered, uh, the first of which has already been pointed out. Uh, federal agencies should not be the decision makers for states or local governments for all goods and services. We, we would like to trust but verify uh, the veracity of anything regulated by the FDA or the USDA because a lot of times they're wrong. Uh, the, list of, uh, the list of items that are regulated by those two agencies are far too broad, and uh, to understand the unintended consequences is almost impossible, but what, we're, what we would be doing effectively is preempting the ability of local governments to act responsibly to crisis created by harmful products. Uh, local governments and their first responders, police and EMS, are the first line of defense against ever-changing fight against uh, toxic substances engineered to skirt the law. Synthetic marijuana is uh, one of those things that Attorney General Sam Owens weighed in on a few years ago. He said, each year the legislature passes a bill that makes certain compounds felonies. The problem is, as soon as the bill is passed, they immediately change the compositions further where it's technically a felony until, until the legislature uh, next comes into session or technically not a felony until the, until the legislature comes into session. Uh, local governments act on public outcry, real outcry, for real reasons. Uh, whether it's a harmful product or a business practice that's in conflict with the public good, that's what moves our people, not personal bias. Uh, when it comes to uh, some of the things that have been discussed, uh, we talk about pets. Uh, and and, and uh, the sale of, of uh, dogs and cats. Cherokee County, some of the, some of the cities in Cherokee County, which is a, a conservative bastion of our state, those cities are not very liberal at all. Uh, those are the ones that have chosen to ban uh, the, the, the actual uh, dog and cat sales. So please take that in consideration. Also, Tobacco products are regulated by the FDA. My child likes bubble gum. When I think of tobacco, I don't think of bubble gum. But that is tobacco flavored uh, hookah, hookah uh, tobacco. When I think of cigars, I do not think of grape. I do think of maybe grape bubble gum. And when you stick this stuff next to uh, products that we sell our children, I think that local governments might have a firm ground to have issue with the type of marketing that that entails. But we're talking about products that entice minors to do things that they probably ought not. We're talking about issues that could lead to crisis, such as the bath salts issue, uh, where cities acted uh, far quicker than the state or any states and the federal government could because a product that was legal started to be a uh, pandemic. And, and its misuse, and it had to be controlled. It had to be banned at the local level. So I appreciate your concern. Uh, I appreciate you listening to us, but, but this bill uh, should not pass, and we appreciate your time. Thank you, Michael. You talking about hookah, I had to look it up to see what it was when I <laughs> saw a sign on, on Piedmont up yonder the other day about a hookah lounge. I didn't have any <laughs> idea what it was. <laughs> I don't see any questions. Thank, Thank you, Andy, Andy Lord. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Thank members of the committee. My name is Andy Lord. I represent the American Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. I uh, appreciate your time this morning, Mr. Chairman. I want to start with an apology to you. Typically, I before testimony, I'd like to speak at a minimum with the sponsor and with the chairman of the committee and as many members as I can. Uh, as of last night, we had not seen this meeting posted and we are, we are running behind in that. I was able to speak yesterday or day before with uh, uh, Representative Jaspers, um, but apologies, I've not spoken with you directly. Um, 
ASP, the ASPCA is vigorously opposed to this bill for some of the reasons that you have already heard. I want to provide a quick context. If this bill sounds familiar, sounds familiar to you, it should. Um, the uh, fundamental tenets of this bill were represented last year in House Bill 144. Uh, House Bill 144 never uh, crossed over from this chamber to the Senate last year, though there were multiple attempts to add the language from 144 to a number of bills on the Senate side last year. But at core, this bill is about two things, puppy mills and preemption. Um, we are concerned first and foremost at ASPCA about the prior. Um, uh, you all may be aware that there is one uh, pet store. Uh, their name is Petland, and as you will see on the, the handout that I've just passed around, they have been the subject of quite the um, uh, media controversy. There have been a number of stories. You'll see about 12 or 13 enumerated here on the back of your handout. These stories um, are all just from the middle of last year. These are not, we're not going back 10 years for these stories. Most recently, um, there was a, uh, a young woman who started working at a brand new Petland store in Gwinnett. She immediately contracted the Campylo Campylobacter virus. This is one of the few viruses that can spread from dogs to humans. She was hospitalized, had over $100,000 of medical bills, um, had a 105 degree fever, and um, her, she and her mom felt her life was in jeopardy. That is not an isolated incident, unfortunately. The Centers for Disease Control um, identified 113 cases of Campylobacter. Uh, depending on whose stats you look at, between 90 and 100 percent of those 113 cases of Campylobacter were attributable to Petland, to either Petland employees who contracted it from a, uh, an animal there um, or to a purchaser of one of the pets. So this is um, widespread enough to where CDC um, uh, issued an advisory on this very issue. We believe, furthermore, that this bad press um, uh, has resulted in uh, the, the formation of something called the Free Market Alliance of Georgia Retailers. Um, you will not see or hear, I don't believe, of anybody that will come to you on behalf of Petland. Um, we believe that's because this bad press has been prolific and because the outbreaks of disease um, associated with them have been prolific. But we think it's also important to note that the uh, Free Market Alliance of Georgia retailers is actually based in Ohio and it is based at the home address, it is registered to the home address of the Petland lobbyist. So we, we, we want to make sure that this committee is clear that that, that alliance is not a Georgia-based or not a Georgia-led um, alliance. Um, lastly, on the, on the preemption front, um, Representative Cook, you mentioned something that, that we are quite concerned about too. I, I don't know how, how, how much more clear these lines, uh, beginning on line, uh, 21 can be. This is as direct of an outsourcing of local government control to federal authorities as I've ever seen. Um, no city, county, consolidated government, or other local governing authority of this state shall prohibit, ban, or otherwise restrict the sale of retail establishment goods, products, or items which are regulated by the USDA, the FDA, or the Georgia Department of Agriculture. I, it's right there. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm dumbfounded that in Georgia we are looking to, um, to outsource to two um, federal agencies. Um, Parvo, Campylobacter, highly attributable to Petland. There is a, a, a pending lawsuit against Petland right now uh, that alleges fraud that is currently being litigated. Um, uh, I, I think the committee should be uh, aware that this, this bill is about one entity. That entity is Petland. We do not believe that Petland's record warrants special protection by this committee um, or this chamber. That's all I have.
Certainly. Thank you, Andy. Anybody got any questions? I, I have one small one. Uh, you were talking about us outsourcing to USDA and FDA and the mm -hmm. GDA. Uh, normally, we do depend on those three to protect us with, with food labeling and medicine labeling and, and all the other stuff that we depend on for our own safety. But it seems like ASPCA's problem is with one store. Is that correct? I think what ASPCA's problem is with any entity that has a, a long, um, consistent track record of um, selling dogs that are from puppy mills that have high level, high um, incidence of the, the diseases that impact the animals and diseases that, that uh, impact the owners and employees of those. So what I think what we would say is any entity that is operating as Petland is, um, ASPCA will object to. So we don't feel like we're singling them out. We feel like they are uh, the single worst actor. Furthermore, we believe that they are the ones that are bringing this bill. So that's why you see our focus on them. But uh, where there is mistreatment of animals um, uh, is where you will see ASPCA and others like us involved. So I, I don't think that we are singling them out. I think that they have singled themselves out. So, so is ASPCA saying that they do not trust USDA, FDA, and GDA? I think what we're saying is that it needs to be a combined effort and that the, uh, I, I think even the USDA would tell you that they may not have the manpower or ability um, to do everything and that uh, there's a partnership between the USDA and local governments, but more importantly, we think that local government should be able to address issues that arise in their neighborhoods that might not be on our radar. And that's been kind of a fundamental tenant um, in, the, in the nearly 20 years I've been working here at the Capitol. Um, the local control and the importance thereof is something that I've heard repeatedly as a fundamental tenant of the House and the Senate. Okay, Rob, is that you? Wh who's number three over there? Oh, Sam, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just curious, do, do you have pets? I do. Do they ever get sick? Mine hasn't. I, I did adopt mine from a shelter, and we've been lucky. We adopted a Weimaraner, and um, <laughs> we haven't had issues so far. He did tear an Achilles, but he has not gotten like a, a viral or bacterial. Well, you know, animals, I have I have a lot of cows, and I have show animals, goats, hogs, a yard full of yard dogs and wild cats and uh, all kind of other things that run around my place. And we tend to have animals that get sick, Absolutely. and that's beyond our control. They're just like people sometimes, yeah. um, and, it, and it does happen. Um, so I, I just wanted to I completely understand. I do want to make a distinction between you know, livestock and these animals that are being sold at, at pet stores. And I do think that there is a distinction there, and I certainly would not disagree with you that, that animals get, get sick. I would argue that we have a disproportionately high number of animals that are getting sick from these specific uh, pet stores. So I would probably argue that if you were buying your livestock from one distributor and you found that those um, goats or cows or whatever were getting sick, and your other ones weren't, you would probably want want to address that. So I, 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 I understand your point. We certainly don't disagree that animals get sick, but the, the venue from which these animals are being purchased is, is probably different. One other point, um, the, w one of the veterinarians from Petland um, has kind of turned whistleblower, and he has um, uh, either in testimony or in affidavit claimed that he was instructed by Petland to, and he has said this on the record, that he was instructed by Petland to give dogs a clean bill of health when he knew they didn't have one. Um, over, uh, that violated his moral constitution. He resigned from Petland and then revealed those stories and has turned to whistleblower. So I think we're talking about slightly different things, but your point is well taken. Tom, real quick, we got two lengthy bills we got to do and we're going to, Loose on the rules. Then I'll wait, sir. 
Rick, you have any closing yeah. thing? <clears throat> yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Um, let's just talk about pet land real quickly. I looked at the <coughs> CDC report on pet land. You know, they do say they did wrong things. You know, but Campylobacter, the bacteria that we're talking about, it's 1.5 million cases of that in the CDC report each year. Many of it comes from poultry and all different things. But the key thing, if you look at, is sanitation. I think the things that we know, I guess in this room more than any probably, is washing your hands breaks the cycle of handling feces, and that's where this comes from. So, but in the end, it's for them, is did the USDA do their job? I think that's what the uh, speaker needs to address is with the USDA. And if we need to do something in Georgia to increase scrutiny or regulatory, please bring us the bill. I'd be glad to work on it, provide Georgian safe products. That's all. And this is not a pet land only. Deal. I've never been to Ohio, and I've not talked to anybody from Ohio, Mr. Chairman. All right, if anybody's got a motion one way or the other, we will take it. Is there a second? <laughs> got a motion, two or three seconds. All in favor of passing 948 uh, on to the floor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. no. Do y'all want to vote? I mean, a hand vote. I just don't want nobody arguing with me. All in favor, raise your hand. Let me see. Seven, eight, nine. All opposed, no. Nine, two. Is that right? Three. Nine, three. All right. Thank y'all. House Bill 8, what's your number, Sam? 886? You can say it right there. You ain't got to. Tell me what, uh, which mic? Three? There's a substitute that's being passed out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. It's uh, good to be here today. We're working off of LC 3453-71S. Um, everybody's got one? Okay. And this is better known um, as the gate bill, as many of you may know. Um, and I guess I just want to first say before I get into the bill, um, you know, I've been asked, um, why, are, why are we doing this? Um, for me personally, um, I farm for a living, and uh, that's what puts food on my table and provides for my family. And this program is uh, vitally important to my livelihood and to many of my constituents in my district. Um, the district I represent um, probably has more gate cards than any district in the state, and the long-term stability of this program is my number one priority. Um, as, you, as you saw in slides earlier, um, farmers are at home um, dealing with things they have to deal with on the farm, and they don't need to worry about things like this. Um, the integrity of this program, um, the stability of this program are vitally important. Um, and with the way things are right now, we don't get a lot of support. And just to get on my soapbox, uh, just a, a minute, Mr. Chairman, um, I've had three editorials in the paper back home this week about this program, and it frustrates me at home when everybody wants to talk about gate, but they don't want to talk about manufacturing exemptions, music exemptions, uh, movies and film and Delta and everything else Watch. like they do. <laughs> gate, right. Um, we're, the only, we're the only industry that has to pay for their own exemption, and do all the things that we have to do. Um, nobody else has to do that. Um, and we get compared to a lot of those um, unfairly, and, and it really upsets me because we're price takers. Uh, we don't get to decide what we sell our products for. Um, we have to take whatever we get, and a lot of times that's not enough. Most of the time it's not enough. 
Um, so that's why we're doing this, is to make sure that this program is, um, has integrity and it is going to be around for a long time um, because it's vitally important to a lot of the, the producers across the state. So I'll, I'll get off of that and we'll get into the bill. Um, as you'll see in section one, um, how do you qualify for this program? And I'm, I'm going to walk through it. And, and we've got several options, as you see there. The first thing we're doing is we're raising it from $2,500 to $7,500. Um, we felt like that was a, a modest increase. Um, at the $2,500 level, I don't know how much integrity um, that number had. Um, and in my conversations, um, we, we need to, to increase the integrity there in that number. Um, so we decided on 7,500. So what does that mean? That means, as you can see, if you're the owner or a leasee of agricultural land or other real property uh, from which 7,500 or more agricultural products were sold, produced and sold during that year, including payments from government sources. That's number one, qualify. Number two, qualifying is if you're engaged in the business of performing agricultural operations. Um, over the 7,500 amount. Number three, you qualify if you're in the business of producing long-term agricultural products from which there might not be annual income but limited to timber, pulpwood, orchard crops, pecans, livestock, and horticultural or multi-year agricultural farm products. And that's in there because obviously you're not going to cut trees down every year. Obviously you may not sell your calves every year. You may decide to keep um, heifers, or if you're more of an orchard crop, you you may not necessarily have a crop in that that first year. So we give you that opportunity to be able to to do that. And of course, that's in 7,500 as well. Um, going on to D there. This person or entity must establish to the satisfaction of the Commissioner of Agriculture that the person is actively engaged in the production of agricultural products and has or will have created sufficient volumes to generate in aggregate at least 7,500 in annualized sales. So that's in there for the Sam Watson that started out a long time ago that bought five cows and he may not have met that, but he had the ability to, to move forward and the Department of Agriculture was able to see that and know that and, and make that decision. Um, going on down, you see the forms that you have to, to qualify or submit to be eligible. Um, there's a section there talking about if, if you do not necessarily file one of those forms and you file a different form, you have to get your uh, receipts and your requirements and other things uh, to the Department of Agriculture to get that verified that you are in the practice uh, of, of farming. Going on down to the bottom of that page, um, the main reason for this bill was prior to this legislation, the Department of Revenue and the Department of Agriculture um, could not communicate about problems. Um, this legislation allows them to be able to communicate each other when there is a problem, if there is a violation they can talk to each other about that violation. So that's that's the main reason that we we did this bill, but we felt like, well, we're gonna do that so they can communicate, let's make a few other changes to make the program better and, and increase the uh, integrity of the program while we go through there. Um, as you flip on over to the next page, uh, all producers will be required to get a, a tax ID number uh, through the Department of Revenue, uh, Georgia Tax Center, um, this would be the number that the Department of Revenue and the Department of Agriculture use to locate you and keep up with you um, so that they know what you're doing uh, with your uh, tax exemption card. Uh, we also decided to go to a three-year card. Um, I hadn't been up here very long this year and I had three or four of my uh, vendors calling me wanting my gate card. Every year we have to renew these gate cards every 12 months. So it's like the, by the time you get it renewed, you have to turn around and somebody's calling you, wanting your card for the next year. So it's a burden on the retailers, it's a burden on the producers. So we felt like going to a three-year card uh, at $150, um, which is later in the bill, would be 
um, a lot more efficient for not only the producers but also the uh, the retailers um, as well. Um, the department would also issue currently they just issue a paper card. Um, this bill would allow the department to issue a uh, a real card. We're going to get they're going to get you know you're going to pay 150 uh, dollars for a three year card. You need something besides a piece of paper. Um, so each year you'll get a new card just like you do an ATM card or a credit card. Um, and that way you can keep on your person and, um, and be able to use that. Um, if you're at your mother-in-law's like I am sometimes and you need to go run buy something at Lowe's or Home Depot and you don't have your card with you, then you have to pay tax. So um, just, just makes, the, makes the program more efficient and, and uh, user-friendly. Um, going on down, it talks about the consequences uh, of violations of this card. Uh, first offense, um, if you're caught violating the use of this card, uh, you're suspended for a year. Um, if you have another offense within five years, um, then uh, a hearing will be held and your card could be revoked uh, up to, uh, you have to wait three years to renew it again. Going on to the last page is the, uh, the $150. Currently the card costs $25. Um, the, uh, the department uh, doesn't quite have enough resources to, uh, to be able to do what they're doing as it is now. Um, and the, the $150 would allow them to have a more up-to-date, state-of-the-art, uh, technologically advanced uh, website uh, that is user-friendly um, that would just be better for the program overall. And then continuing on down is more of the sharing the information between the two departments uh, to make sure that everyone is doing what they're supposed to be doing, using the card properly, and um, there is no fraud. Um, that is the bill, and um, I would appreciate your support. And, and as I said, we just want, we want integrity. Um, we want to make sure that there is sustainability um, and that the long-term impacts of this bill will be around uh, long after we're gone, and we think this bill does that. And uh, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Chairman Watson. There's a couple of questions. Uh, one thing you left out of that list of folks that's getting tax exemption is that absolutely none of the ones you listed are absolutely necessary to survive. So, yes, sir. You are correct. You know, what, what we do and what we're trying to help with here is something everybody that's walking needs. So, uh, number nine, is that you, Emory? No, no. Oh, Scott, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing the bill. Appreciate you. Um, you had mentioned earlier in your testimony that this is the only program that you have to pay to be part of, and I'm I'm empathetic to that. Is is this in, in lines 100 through 105, that part where you have to pay specifically? That's the $100, uh, $150? Or do yes, you have sir, to pay? Yes, sir. That is correct. Or do you have to pay additional in, on top of that? That's no, the, you originally it was 25 and we're going up to $150. And that's, that's money that goes into the general fund, correct? That is correct. So it's not actually going to the department to fund any activities that they would have specifically? No, sir. How would you feel about just getting rid of it? Well, the I think the conversation behind the hundred and fifty dollars was an integrity thing. Um, you know, we've, we've got bad actors in the world, whether we like it or not. And twenty five dollars is twenty you know twenty five dollars is a lot less than one hundred and fifty dollars. And we want people that are serious, um, that it means a lot to them, and and that they see value in that. Um, Sometimes $25, somebody might pay that and move on. But $150, they might think about it because in reality, they're going to have to spend about $2,000 in sales tax exempt products to get their $150 back. Mm -hmm. So it just, it's just one of those integrity things to, to help increase the, the integrity of the program. Uh, my concern is if we have, if we're giving away tax exemptions to other industries that, that you mentioned, that I often vote against those tax exemptions um, because they don't. They're not as important as what we're talking about here, uh, among other reasons. But I if 
there are enforcement mechanisms in the bill. You've, you've done a great job of putting those in there. Uh, you know, you lose your ability for three years uh, if you get caught. And, uh, and knowing that, along with the fact that we have tax exemptions that we give to the movie companies and, and other businesses, we're not charging them for their integrity. You know, uh, is a farmer not as trustworthy as a movie producer? You, you make a very good point. Um, I, I do. I, you don't know how the department would feel about that, as far as you know, the funds are appropriated. Um, I guess we decide how much the, the department receives in that in that aspect to manage and oversee the program, because um, they do have staff. They have a call center. They have IT. They have some auditors that travel to the state. Revenue has some auditors that work on the program. So there is an expense to the state. Um, Sure, but all these funds aren't going directly to the department. They're they're going in the general fund. I I agree. So, uh, I, if you're if you're willing to entertain it, I would love to amend to just take that out. If you're willing, I don't want to uh, do it if you don't want to. Well, I would like to maybe hear from the departments on okay. their insight on that. Um, Gary, can I get a couple of more questions because you make an answer them all while you and Miss Lynn stand <laughs> up and, and talk? <laughs> but y'all listen to them, so, so I haven't got to remember. Uh, Tom? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sam, we certainly support what you're doing here. But i got a question. On line, starting on line uh, 44, uh, the, the new language, that, and I'm going kind of in the middle. The applicant shall provide to the Commissioner of Agriculture any documentation, tax returns, forms, or sales receipts required by the Commissioner of Agriculture and the Commissioner of Agriculture. It seems a little redundant. Yeah, I think yeah, Gary, that may Gary, be. Gary says that's not him twice. He'll answer that one too. Okay. So we, it looks like we need a change there. And then down on the very bottom, is that the same where it says be furnished to the Commissioner of Agriculture and the Commissioner? That didn't. Yeah, that's just typo there, I believe. That's uh, other than the Commissioner of Agriculture is a large C. This Commissioner is a little C. I noticed that too. So somebody didn't think highly. Yeah. I think I think Commissioner is is Lynn. That's what I was guessing. Somewhere in the definitions, I remember That's seeing right. something about commissioner means. Commissioner of Ag, yeah. DOR, Commissioner of Agriculture, Commissioner of Agriculture. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. What what David said on line 46, mm -hmm. let's just go and clear that up right quick make that a little C and take off of agriculture on that second commission of agriculture. All right. Then that, that would be the, that close, Tom. Would that be the revenue commissioner yeah. then? Yeah, commissioner is mm -hmm. defined as revenue. <coughs> that it? Yep. Tim, that it you, Emory? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> Chairman Watson, let me ask a question for the small people that they, they really do not make a living as a farmer, and I appreciate every one of you that are farmers. Uh, it's nice to go and sit down and have a great steak or eat some butter beans or okra or whatever we have that you grow. And, and peanuts, I had a ton of boiled peanuts this weekend. Um, with this, though, for the small ones, there's a lot of us, as you stated, started off with just a few cows. And then you grew that to a big, become a bigger farmer. And with this, some of us have bees. We have blueberry bushes. We have chickens. We're not here to make a big living, but we provide to our community. Mm -hmm. With that, the 2,500 mark is for the not bad actors. It's something that we might meet, might just barely go over. And then what happens is we now are raising that mark to 7,500 for the bigger guys. I agree with you, our priorities down here are not always right because we exempt the whole state of Georgia from everything else, mm -hmm. but the necessities. Let me ask you another question. Um, I, I would prefer it to stay at 25, 
Um, I have a tractor. I, I'll buy certain little things that I use on that. I hardly ever use the gate card, but when I do, it's for a purchase that I only use on the little farm I have. Um, when you pay online, the 25 goes to $20. Now, we're going to go to 150 If you pay online, is it going to still be 150 or is there a consideration to um, lower that price like we did uh, with the 25 to 20 or basically it's just going to be $150, correct? I, well, I think that would be to the, yeah, it's going to be 150 Okay. And, and again, thank you, but, you know, it's it's like, you know, we had a storm come through and lost a bunch of bushes. Well, guess what? That's when you have 40 blueberry bushes and you're down to 12, that makes a, a difference. When you have, uh, you lose nine beehives, that's a little bit of money out of honey. Um, so there's different things that happen when you have to hunt down some raccoons that are taking a lot of chickens. Uh, you take care of those things as you need. But again, just for the small, and you know, the small person here, uh, you know, I think you've increased that threshold. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you. Yeah, and you know, the, the, the 7,500, um, you know, there again, there's, there's a lot of differences between our exemption and other people that get exemptions. Yes, sir. Um, but it's, you know, coming up with 75, it's like uh, if it was 12.5, we would be talking about 10. If it was, you know, we're talking about 75, should it need to be 5? You know, so there's a lot of conversation there. And, and where is, what makes you small? Uh, if I were to go home and, and poll a lot of my constituents, they would say, you know, 25 or 30 would be good for me. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, ways you could you could talk about that number. Um, but we do feel like that we are given some discretion in the ability to, as, as through those, you know, a qualified producers where the department um, realizes. And obviously, I, you know, I use uh, over 100 hives a year uh, to pollinate my cucumbers and my squash. Um, so that is a very important uh, industry to the state. Um, so I we'll see how that moves through the process. Thank you. Move number five. That's you, Rob. Uh, let's do four. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I just want to appreciate the um, uh, uh, chairman bringing this bill. It's a great bill. I've got my great ca uh, gate card right here. It's very valuable uh, and, and, and keeps Georgia agriculture competitive. I mean, we're not only competitive within the state, but of course, all over the country and uh, other states. And, and um, th this, this uh, gate program is, is vitally important to keep Georgia agriculture um, uh, competitive. And, uh, a, a, and I really appreciate uh, Donahoe over there trying to supplement his uh, meager uh, <laughs> state representative salary with some, with some uh, farming. And uh, <laughs> it, I, I don't know which you make more money off of, your, 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 your bushes <laughs> or, your, or your legislative salary. But, uh, but I, I, I think uh, Chairman Watson's got this uh, number uh, right. And uh, it's, it's not net $7,500 to your back pocket. It, it's gross. And a lot of other expenses uh, uh, are, are behind that seventy-five hundred dollars. It's fuel and and, and um, other things and fertilizer. So, thank you. I, I really appreciate um, the, the updates to this program, and I think it'll make it a stronger, more integri integrity um, program for all of us that use it. Gary, you want to try to answer Scott's question, or Miss Lynn, either one, whichever. Good morning, members and friends. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, some interesting questions that the representative had brought up with respect to the cost of administering this and the where the monies go and what the money should be and what the level should be. Um, I, d I don't want, not going to belabor or go back, but, it, but I think it's really important. We better look at sales tax history first. And first, first, let me let me say for the record, I appreciate the chairman bringing the bill. I support the bill. I think it is an answer to what we've been searching for. Is it the only answer? Is it then? Is it not room for everybody else to have other opinions? That that's not a conflicting uh, support of the bill. It's just we got to find a way to solve a problem. A lot of people have been talking. We thought this was a good idea of how to do it. Correct, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, 
Well, let's go back. Thing, uh, inputs for agricultural products have been exempt from state sales tax forever in this state. Now, they were a hodgepodge, a quilt of different things in Title 48. Back when I used to sit this microphone in, in another capacity, I've, I've been probably been responsible for adding several of those or, or at least helping along the way. And it was just a hodgepodge. And uh, the one that I remember the most is LP gas. I mean, LP gas, uh, uh, some of our friends in the poultry industry were very successful in having LP gas exempt from sales tax a long time ago. But if you're cooking tobacco, Representative Larricky, it's tough because it, it wasn't exempt for that. Or it wasn't exempt for drying peanuts or whatever else. So that's why, s so when the former speaker got this whole thing going about the whole revenue study, this was part of a compromise way back when to set a $2,500 limit. And there wasn't any talk about a fee, but they compared it to Tennessee. Some of y'all that remember this, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's pretty right. Well, when we move forward with the energy exemption, what, in 2012? Is that when that was? Then this was pulled off of the shelf because it had been done two or three years before and it was really stuck in in conference. And then we, uh, we, our testimony back to you at that time is we thank you for trusting us enough to run the program that we didn't get any money to do it and we had to backfill that in supplemental if some of you were remembering and it came, somebody came up with $25. Okay, what we do know is back then, we had way back when, we had no earthly idea how many people were getting the exemption. None whatsoever and that alarmed a lot of people. And there were a lot of hawkish people that were actually wanting to do away with the whole thing. And that's why this level came up and, and it compared it to Tennessee. And we said, okay, we'll get a card, boom, boom, boom. Well, we've all grown in this process together and trying to understand how it is administered. And now we had last year 39,000 cards. So we have a defined universe. We know how much that is. But I will admit, I've said, I've said dozens of times, I don't understand why we are the only ones that had to pay for the privilege to get it. Okay, but I also have a strong agriculture constituency who believes in the integrity of the program and they're willing to do it because they don't want the hawkish attacks on the program anymore and if this will uh, cure it, then, then, then they're willing. So that's kind of where we've, had, had, that's, where we, that's what's got us to where we are today. Because we put $25, what we wind up doing is giving somebody almost an incentive to lie. Because they'll say, I'll risk 20 bucks, $2,500, yeah, I'll sign off on that. And the, the Lynn and I, the commissioners, our best ability, we try to check on folks, but that's no more than checking people running up and down the interstate. Uh, it's the same. It, we, they don't catch, you don't catch everybody driving 80 or 85. And so we, we do some, and we, we've not seen a whole lot of, I think Commissioner Riley could tell you, we haven't seen grand abuse. We have a lot of anecdotal stories. And some get pulled out, and they say, "Well, I tried to buy my, I, you know, I, the one that comes to mind is uh, I'd, I, I'd like to buy my countertops because I'm building my house on my farm." That was one from a Home Depot story, and and there's a, there's a, there there's some of those that are that are out there. So, my 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 point to you is this is this is is, and 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 I really if. Uh, yeah. I, I don't, I'm not being wishy-washy on you. I'm, I'm not s so much into the, the philosophical nature of whether it ought to be a fee or not so much as I am making sure there's a program and the users of the program are willing to do that. Uh, but what we've, if, we, if we somehow went another way, it costs money to administer this. So that's, uh, that's got to come from somewhere. And so... Uh, even if you go up on this fee, the question I would ask you, Mr. Chairman, is talking with appropriations and already have, and with Chairman Powell, we've had numerous discussions about this, is that if you're going to do it, at least appropriate the money back to us, and then we can make sure that Lynn has adequate, uh, Commissioner Riley has, excuse me, has a different, uh, has su sufficient auditors, that we do have a little more robust IT capabilities, 
And then when we, we're not looking for a windfall, but we can get the supplemental next year. And, and if, it, if we need to balance the books, you balance the books and su supplemental. Please don't add more stuff to us and then let us backfill our budget in supplemental because that's what happened the first time. And so that's kind of that's kind of where we are. I, I stand with Chairman Watson and uh, and then uh, but I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Thank you, Gary. Uh, who is number nine? Is that you, Darlene? And then we'll get Scott and we kind of need to move on. We may have to put off a uh, bit there. This was a question for um, Sam. Does this on line um, 37 when it talks about farm rentals, does that include things like um, the sundowner or <coughs> foggy pond that are farm rentals for activities? That's what it's saying. Does that mean like a events farm? Um, I have. An events farm? I don't know. I, well, they, I, mean, I don't know if it's farm just farm rental. I don't know if it's just farm rental or okay, that's what agritourism or. Thank you. All right, Scott. Thank you. Uh, the question for the commissioner. Thank you for the testimony there. Yes, um, how much does it cost to administer the gate program today? We're in the. Let me, let's let's tell you what we get, and then I'll tell you where it's applied. We have a, an appropriation of about seven hundred thousand dollars this year mm -hmm. okay two hundred thousand of that goes towards five compliance officers that are part-time employees that y'all authorized two years ago okay and they've been working on retail uh, retail education um, we have hundred seventy five thousand of that all of that money is appropriated to us but then we through uh, is it seven hundred MOU go to hundred seventy five thousand dollars to Commissioner Riley and she has three uh, I think you have them classified as auditors that that are been working accounts and and have done some retail audits as I'm well. So, did you say seven hundred seventy-five thousand? No, sir. Seven. But seven hundred fifty. Seven fifty. Okay. I believe it's seven fifty. And, and of two, the two hundreds compliance with us with five people, one seventy-five is auditors for her for her, and then the balance is the utilization that we have internally for IT. For our calling center, and and representative that can that can ebb and flow, uh, but but I if there is a little windfall in that for us, it's not much. So the question, uh, the next question is of that uh, of the thirty nine thousand card holders that you have currently, how many are paying the twenty dollars versus the twenty five? Uh, that average is online about seventy six percent. Seventy six percent of that, so. Closer to we're we're bringing in closer to eight hundred thousand dollars today. Um, Indeed. And you're spent. We're spending seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So we're, there's about a thirty thousand dollar delta. Indeed. How many people do you think are going to drop out of the program and not renew their card if we go to this model? And that, that is, that's where we purely get a guess. So if you and if I, if I were going to budget, what I've spoken to Chairman Watson and Chairman Powell about, if we're at thirty nine thousand. Thirty thousand. If okay. you're going to budget in thirty thousand, then that's going to raise your your first year's income to three million, and then it's the one point five million subsequently. This is where I'm going with this. So if we go, if we say thirty thousand people renew at one hundred and fifty dollars, this program costs about. Let, let's be generous and round it up to a million dollars. We're going to we're going to generate four and a half million dollars in new revenue. Mm -hmm. That's four. that's thirty thousand people times one hundred and fifty dollars. That would be four and a half million dollars to the general fund yep, for a program that costs about seven hundred and eighty thousand dollars to run. That is, if you annualize that. That's not annualized. Okay, so if I divide that by three, then we're still at one and a half million dollars. So we're doubling up what it costs to run the program. Can you see why I'm hesitant to to, to sign on to one hundred and fifty dollars? <laughs> I'm just yes, doing the math real quick right here, just on the fly. So yes. I divide the four and a half million no, by three. I still no. get to one and a half million dollars. It's still twice as much money as okay, it would cost I, to administer. I think I, I, if the thirty thousand were to hold, I can give you pretty much an exact. Because see, what you're going to do is you're going to go to three million. What you're going to do is first, w the, 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 it allows for we'd have to have a three-year phase in. You don't want you can't roll them all one year. 
because then you can't appropriate money for two years. So it's not that one 4.5 windfall the first year. It's actually, it would be 10,000 per year. We would phase them in. So there's 10, 10 at 150, 10 at 100, and 10 at 50. So that's, that's gonna get you three million the first year and one and a half million in subsequent years. Right, so it's a, it's a net windfall for the general uh, fund. Uh, no, there's no doubt about that. But I go back to the fact of, all right, what, what, how are we going to enforce this? How are we going to fund it? And if, 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 if there's a possible to put a threshold at something that would help itself police itself, then the producers of the state are willing to pay for it. And that's, and that's, I, I as heard a, that from As a consumer of the awesome products that the farming community produces, I don't want to pay additional for my food if I don't have to, and because you guys are going to pass that cost on to me as a consumer. Can't. <laughs> you can't. A producer We're can't pass a cost of, of 100 <laughs> bucks home to you. Well, That's impossible. A producer is a well cost taker. He's not a. He's, he's a price taker, not a price setter. So that. Well, we go back to. I, I hear I, what you're I'll saying. I'll concede that, that point, that but I go back to. That one yeah, I, I, I'll concede with <laughs> that point. But I, I do have concerns that we're we're generating far more revenue than it takes to to administer the program. Yes, sir. that's it. Thank you, Mr. Yes, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, may I, may I also have one one additional and far more we could talk about, and we can analyze those kinds of things. But one thing I do know is that uh, invest whatever we were whatever we're given on this, the investment is going to be made in IT. We're we're going. This bill calls for an annual card, which would be like a plastic card, not a not a coded card, not a chip card, but at least a card, so that my this year's red, next year's yellow, next year's green, and so if I'm in the yellow year and I don't have a yellow card, I can't cheat, and that was a brilliant part of the chairman's suggestion in the bill. But it costs money to hand to mail out red and yellow and green cards. And and we don't exactly sure how much th that will, but there will there will be there will be increased cost. And so, but thank you for your points. Thank you, Commissioner. We got three people that wanted to talk: Brian, Will, and Alex. If y'all will kind of line up. Uh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Brian Toller, uh, George Agri Business Council. We very much appreciate Representative Watson uh, bringing this bill. This is something that he's very passionate about, certainly as a card holder, but also the integrity of the card, what it means to his local community and the, um, and the issues that uh, have been discussed there locally for him. Uh, and also to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, you've been a great guidepost on this, as has uh, Representative Dickey, as a, not only a farmer, but an advocate for our industry, so we greatly appreciate that. This is very much an integrity issue. Two years ago, we dealt with this issue, and it was, uh, it was a battle. It was a battle on a lot of fronts, and thankfully that bill did not pass, but it did lead us to the path of a better bill today. And we see there's a lot of key components to what makes this this gate card program better from the legislation that's brought by uh, Representative Watson on this. First off, for the Georgia Agribusiness Council, we have over 1,100 member companies. Those are also the farmers, a lot of them are farmers, and are also retailers, input suppliers. So we run the gamut on this, and it's important that this program not create a lot of burdens for the retailer. The system that's described to you that Chairman Watson's outlined, as well as what Commissioner Black's outlined, makes it where it's more palatable for the retailer as well as the gate card holder. So we like that aspect of it. The multi-card component is terrific. We've been asking for this for a long time, uh, and so we're glad to see that obviously captured in here. Strengthening the penalties for those that do or may abuse the program. We don't want to see abuse of the program. Y'all know this. We've continued to advocate for the education piece of it for since the program was developed. So. Um, that piece of it is great and also is captured in the bill the Department of Agriculture is required to provide education information to gate card holders when those cards are issued as well as work with the retailers to continue to do what they've been doing to provide that ed education component. All of these pieces help provide the integrity of the program. Now, I also want to comment on Representative Turner's comment about the cost of the program. 
This program is very important to agriculture. It's very important to the gate card holders, and they have expressed a willingness to pay the additional fees because they want to make sure that the program has the integrity it needs, that the Department of Agriculture has the money they need to manage the program in an effective way, and we believe the threshold of increasing from 2500 to 7500 does that as well. We're not so much hung up on the threshold as we are making sure that the Department of Agriculture does have the money they need to provide the services that are adequate to make sure the gate card holders that should have a card actually access a card and they can use it in a professional manner, and that's our goal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all my comments. Thank you, Brian. Will? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I'm Will Bentley with Georgia Cattlemen's Association. I got a long list of things about the bill that are good, Representative Watson, but for sake of time, I won't go through those. Um, I know that y'all have heard a lot from me, and I want to give a little bit of context about our concern, which is basically the threshold. For our industry, which is made up of small producers across the state, we have cattle in all 159 of the counties in, in Georgia. This threshold change does get into close to the average producer in the state of Georgia. So just talking about moving it from 2,500 to 7,500, I know it may sound like a really small farmer, but looking at it, that's somewhere between 15 and 20 head of cattle in the state of Georgia. And just in our membership alone, which we have 5,500 farmer members, we're talking about 1,500 members just in our association that would no longer qualify for that threshold. Now, I appreciate the work to include livestock in the potential to um, and, and that's something we really appreciate those efforts. But, you know, when you're talking about 15 to 20 head of cattle, you're also talking about an average size of about 80 acres per farm. So I just wanted to add that context of where our concerns were. We do appreciate the work of trying to uh, make changes to the program because it's extremely beneficial to our industry. It's extremely beneficial to all farmers across the state. So we want to make sure the integrity stays there. But we believe that small farmers have just as much integrity as anybody else, and they deserve the program just like all other producers. So I thank you for your time. Thank you, Will. Alex? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee, uh, for allowing me to address you today. Uh, and thank you, Chairman Watson, for bringing forth this legislation and w for working with us so far on this. Um, I'm Alex. I work with uh, Georgia Farm Bureau, and I'm speaking to you on behalf of are nearly 300,000 members across our 159 county organizations, um, including producers of all of Georgia's very diversified commodities. Um, this bill addresses a very important topic that earned some careful consideration because of just that. Uh, Georgia's extremely diverse agricultural offerings elicit a lot of varying needs across the state, which is kind of the crux of this, uh, of what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, the GATE program does apply to all producers, and it's important to remember that as these changes are proposed that the needs of all of these commodities are protected in a, in a responsible way. Um, as Commissioner Black mentioned, uh, the, the history of the ag sales tax exemptions uh, before were just a little bit of a patchwork quilt system. Um, when the 2010 General Assembly created a study committee addressing tax reform, which ultimately resulted in HB 386. Um, and they found that agricultural input exemptions were inconsistent and should be modified to simplify into a clean program that was equitable and fair to all producers, but also provided the necessary uh, safeguards and qualifications that was not available until the GATE program was put in place. Um, another important note to from that tax council's logic for maintaining sales tax exemptions for agriculture had nothing to do with the desire to help farmers. Uh, the reasoning outlined in the council's report described the pyramiding of taxes when sales taxes are collected on inputs at each level of production. And this layering placed Georgia's in largest industry at a competitive disadvantage to our surrounding states and in the global marketplace. Um, as a result of uh, the GATE program is both more competitive and better uh, tax policy, and it plays a critical role in the success of our farmers across the state and the contributions that they return to their, their local economies. This is why Farm Bureau and our farmers are committed to maintaining the integrity of this program for our future generations and why we're willing to pay a fee for access to a program when other industries do not. We want to ensure that 
resources are available for appropriate administration and enforcement um, of the rules. We also want to ensure that there's ample education and outreach to both cardholders and retailers participating in the program, which we as an organization, as well as some of our industry partners, have done over the years through our own communications and means. Um, I do think that this bill has a, a lot of good aspects addressing some of the hiccups that we've realized since GATE was established. Uh, we support the flexibility that this bill provides the Commissioner of Ag in developing appropriate application criteria the collection of necessary tax documentation, determining qualification. Uh, we also support the sharing of information between the Department of Ag and Department of Revenue to effectively police the program, identifying those bad actors and imposing the consequences outlined in this bill on those who, who abuse it. Um, another change this bill proposes reflects a creative solution discussed among stakeholders that creates a barrier to entry that deters folks who are looking to make a few small purchases but aren't necessarily legitimate producers. Moving to a multi-year card, you increase the amount a person must purchase in order to uh, recuperate the cost of the card. And we support this multi-year card at, a, at an increased price to help set that, that entry to bear, that barrier to entry. Um, we do ask that the, the fees, whatever that is determined, be kept to uh, the GATE programs, administration, outreach, education, and enforcement, however. Um, there are two aspects I want to raise concern to on the first two pages. I recognize the intent of establishing a high threshold of product sales as an indicator of legitimate operations, but I'm concerned that at the 7,500 level that this will unnecessarily kick out legitimate producers of some commodities. Uh, from a tax policy standpoint, I find it hard to distinguish between a dollar exempt from a small-scale farmer and that of a large-scale farmer. Again, going back to the needs of all of Georgia's various commodity producers and not wanting to deter our upcoming generations from being able to start a farm. Um, so I say carefully consider the impact of tripling the current threshold we have uh, and whether those that will be kicked out of the program are being denied for legitimate reasons. Um, the second and last concern I have is found on line 60 to 63, and this is requiring gate card holders to maintain receipts of purchases with their gate card. I'm not sure that this will provide much tangible benefit to the enforcement of the program rules rather than be a burden on the producer, but if the committee does see fit to keep this requirement, I would ask that there be some clarification as to how long those receipts be kept uh, and those how long they need to maintain those records. That Thank it. you, Mr. Chairman. All right, number seven. They they pushing us to get pages in here. So uh, okay. I'll, anyway, I'll Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, at, this, at this appropriate time, I would like to uh, to make an amendment to the bill. Have at it. Okay, on on line eighteen and line twenty one. Um, remove that 7,500 uh, and make that 5,000. So it would go from 2,500 to 5,000. What about on the next And then, page? yes, yes, I'm sorry. And then on line 27 and 32 as well, and I believe that's Making that as an, a motion? Yes, to sir. Amend it. Motion to amend. Yes, sir. Second in. All right. Got a motion to amend the seventy-five hundred to five thousand on the threshold, and a second. Are there any questions? All, right, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Okay. All right, Sam. Did you want to say anything else to? Finish up. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, based upon what we heard today, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I would like to amend line 60 also as a favor. Again, based upon the math that we were doing earlier, on lines 102 and 150 to 75. Page 8. Page 8, yeah. 
you object all this long? I'd, I'd rather just leave it right. You know, I, I, you know, I think the 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 industry sees value in in paying that. Um, it's worth it to them. Um, they want to carry their own weight. Um, that's just the way they operate. Um, so I, I appreciate it though, and I'm I'm with you. But it's we do have bad actors out there, and we won't we won't value you, and we won't it's take. Not about the bad actors. It's about we're we're charging way more than way more than what we'd actually pay to, to make it for them. And we're we're going to work on that too on the on the other side. Thank you, Scott. One thing I want everybody, since we are on TV in here, I want everybody to understand that the, the actual producers are not the ones that the bad actors. Yes, right. right. There are people who get these gate cards by some qualification that <coughs> are more the bad actors that we're trying to rein in than the actual folks that are the producers. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't want some news media getting a hold to it and writing some crazy story again. Um, all right, is there anything else on, on uh, 886? Do I hear a motion do pass as amended? Do pass. I guess it would be a committee substitute, too, wouldn't it? Yeah. And on 946, we'll make that change. Okay. All right. So we have a motion do pass 886 as a ad committee substitute. With the changes from 7,500 to 5,000, is that a second? Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. All right. Thank you. We got one more bill, and we want to do it real quick. Clay says he can do it in five minutes. Clay, Rick, Sam, Darlene, Tom Kirby, and Bill McGowan have worked and worked on this thing, along with Brian Five Ash and the veterinarians and Georgia Farm Bureau and the Cattlemen Association, and I think everybody's in. Singing off the same sheet. So go ahead, Clay, right quick while we're here. All right, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I offer to you um, uh, House Bill 956. If you look on your sheet, it's uh, LC450093 ERS. LC450093 ERS. I'd like to thank the veterinarians for working with me on this bill. Uh, for those that the chairman just mentioned, this is a change uh, in the, it's the first rewrite of the veterinary code in a good many years. Uh, several definitions are added. I'm going to walk it through you very, very quickly. Uh, but general definitions basically to clarify uh, the veterinary terms and procedures in a changing veterinary climate. Uh, if you'll turn to page six, um, this is one of particular interest uh, on page six is the uh, VCP, VC. Uh, PR, which is the veterinary client patient relationship. Um, there were some minor changes, so it complies with the Veterinary uh, Feed Act, Feed Directive, and uh, it's a federal deal that we need to make sure that we have our language in line with the federal language. Um, and there was also a change there to provide consumer protections that ensures uh, veterinarians licensed by the state could practice in the state. Uh, and which is the, on line 197 on page 6, provided, however, that such initial relationship cannot be established solely but may be maintained by telephone, computer, or other electronic means, does not mean that we're keeping uh, veterinarians from practicing with um, telemedicine, if you will, uh, but it uh, is basically keeping the, uh, uh, the guy that's not in the state, that is not licensed in the state, that needs a boat payment, uh, and he, he keeps him from establishing an online uh, presence and selling uh, prescription medicine. Um, the next part is the veterinary feed directive, which is uh, on page seven uh, at the bottom on B. Uh, this is language that allows the Georgia Code to come in compliance with the federal code. Um, Article two on page eight. Uh, deals the board powers and it gives the board the ability to inspect vet premises and equipment uh, and which is needed so we look after the the safety and, and public health of, of our companion animals and and make sure that our, our veterinarians are, are uh, practicing uh, clean uh, good medicine um, article 3 page 10 is the vet require vet standards which includes a uh, continuing education requirements for vet techs I think this is a uh, this was a good uh, good ad uh, as well. 
Uh, page 19 provides for the board to issue temporary license to military spouse. For those of you that have military bases nearby, we've, we've done a good many of these. Uh, this included is there. Uh, page 20, it is, this, is, this is what the farmers actually want to see on this page 20 and the chairman is most interested in. These are the things that we can still practice as, um, uh, as a good animal husbandry uh, for, our, for our animals. Um, these, this act is not intended to prohibit, prohibit these particular things. And it's got a listing of those, including an additional veterinary approved products uh, and also with the semen em embryo uh, collection and storage. Um, so it, it uh, provides protections for uh, veterinarians. It allows us to uh, come into compliance with the federal standards. Uh, and it provides the board the ability to enforce actually these, these powers. Um, and I, I think it's a good bill for your consideration. I appreciate the vets. Uh, and their help. I met with them Sunday, um, and uh, they were willing to meet with me in Tifton. I appreciate that to get the language that we wanted, and uh, thank you for that. Anybody have any questions for Clay? I appreciate the subcommittee doing so much work on this, because last time we rewrote this thing, it turned into a battle for about two years. Uh, Brian, did y'all have anything to say? Dr. Cobb as well. I didn't mention him, but thank you, Dr. Cobb. Yeah, yeah. And y'all okay? Yeah. Got a motion to a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Oh, no. All right. We have ruined our reputation for having short meetings, but thank y'all again <laughs> for all you did and staying. Please.